Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode two of Agent Provocateur with Alan Walsh and Adam Wild. We are here today with one of my favorite people in the entire world, Glenn Healy. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Glenn, uh, and I hope I'm not embarrassing you along the way. Current executive director of the NHL Alumni Association, hailing from Pickering, Ontario, Western Michigan University, four years playing NCAA Division I as an all-star goalie there, undrafted, signed as a free agent uh, to the LA Kings, and I believe that was in 1985, a 16-year NHL career, the Stanley Cup champion, and a uh, well-noted broadcaster with the iconic Hockey Night in Canada, and also Director of Player Affairs at the NHLPA. During Glenn's NHL career, a noted leader amongst NHL players, very involved in issues of governance at the NHLPA, transition of leadership, and collective bargaining. Glenn Healy. Yay! Can I ask the first question? <laughs> yes, please. What the fuck's a provocateur? Yeah, I'm my phone. I'm trying. Hey, a, uh, a, uh, a, a, yeah. Please, please tell me what that is. What's up? What's up? Hey, heels. I don't know what it is either. Just don't tell anyone. Yeah. That sounds really official. And <laughs> so let's just. Let's go with it. People will never, you know, if you say it big enough and strong enough with enough emotion, they'll never question you because they're like, I'm really stupid. I don't know what that is, but I'm afraid to ask. So, yeah, <laughs> I thought I'd be the first one on your second show to ask what it, anyways, we can get it out of the way. It's all good. Uh, uh, my, my, me first, my first question, Heels, I want to ask you Do you recall the first time we ever met? Uh, yeah, it was that uh, we were naked in the beach in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Not that time. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, our, our first chance meeting, I would think it probably would have been at one of the agent meetings, the NHLPA. Uh, but I could be wrong. Um, this 59 year old has killed a few brain cells. So my memory fades a little bit. But uh, but you were very, very confident and efficient and you represented players well and so we always had a great relationship so it could have been that or it it could have been uh when alan eagleson was going through his misfortune uh, self-imposed suicide uh that that we had a chance encounter but but we've known each other a long time that's for sure we had a chance encounter on the afternoon of august 27 1985. And do you know where you were on that date? Uh, no. So I went to a Bruce Springsteen concert at CNE in yes. 1985. And I went there with a goalie by the name of Jim Hickey, also from Pickering, Ontario, who was with me at University of Illinois. And uh, and Jim said to me, hey, there's uh, Glenn Healy from Western Michigan. He just signed with the L.A. Kings. Let's go say hello. And I had seen you play many times at Western Michigan, and you were like a god to me because you were the best goalie of your entire era in the NCAA. And went up and met you, and we talked for about 15, 20 minutes. We talked about a bunch of different Springsteen songs. We talked about hockey. We talked about the L.A. Kings. And that was the first time I met you, and I've never forgotten it. Obviously, you have. Uh, clearly, <laughs> he, need, he needs a trophy. <laughs> I know it's a dance trophy. It was one of my daughters, but Alan, you just deserve it. I, yeah, I, I'm now, okay, it, it's kicking in, and I do remember, and uh, Jimmy was a whale of a goalie, too. Yep. And, and, yep, Pickering guy, big family. I've known their entire family, and that might have been – uh, maybe my one and only concert I think I've ever gone to. I'm a bagpiper, so 
talk about eclectic, talk about weirdo, talk about not getting to know what Springsteen's all about. But I do remember going to that concert. Now I remember us chatting. And so, yes, the light is on in the cave. This should be a good interview now. I, I, right. Glenn, right. Glenn I, I just want to jump in here. I've seen you on stage, Glenn. I was, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the only time that Paul McCartney will do Mull of Kintyre, or one of the only times, is in Toronto. And I believe you are on stage for, I believe, don't you go on stage every time he's in town to do that yeah. song? The, the, the song is unique. It's Mull of Kintyre. It's, uh, it's one of his his, it's his best, like clearly because bagpipes are in it, but um, <laughs> it, it's got a little bit of melody in it, but a lot of it is harmony. And so, you know, words like sea, sky, glen, deer, you know, you've got to play harmony notes to go along with a band that's, that's tuned to the key of E flat. And so it's very difficult for a lot of bands to perform and, and put it on when it's band on the run. Mm -hmm. And then it's yesterday and then it's Mull of Kintyre. And then it's, well, I guess you got to end it with Let It Be. But, and he'll tell you right away, 11-14, we're coming to get you. And they basically mic the drones. The band comes up from the stage, you know, majestic looking band of about 50 people. The drones <laughs> are mic'd all the way across the crowd. The crowd, you got a big ovation and we play it uh, with them. The hard part you have when you play it is because the crowd is so loud, Right. When he sings those keywords, deer, Glenn, sea, sky, you can't hear him. So oh, look up at the jumbotron and read his lips and be able to nail it. And so oh, wow. We have been Jeez. fortunate to uh, to play with him on a number of occasions. And he's always been gracious. He's always introduced himself to the band. Uh, I have a picture of us playing at the Air Canada Center, the concert that you were at. And if you look at the picture close and he signed it to everybody, you see this little kind of a blondish head sticking up over the uh, stage. It's Matt Sundin. So Matt's wow. had a injury and came to the concert and he's like, I ain't missing this. So he came with the band as we walked in. The whole band came up and then here comes Matt. He peeks his head up so he can watch. Uh, but you know what? To, to get a chance to say that I'm the fifth Beatle. <laughs> <laughs> Like that, you don't get better than that. And it's, it's uh, here's the big joke. It's the only time that Glenn actually got to play at the Air Canada Center. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, I mean, guys, I, there, there's there's so much to, to talk about here today. The focus and Glenn, I know that you've got you're like Alan war chest of unbelievable stories that we could talk to you about. But this one in particular is one that I think is often forgotten when we look at, at the NHL and we talk about labor dispute. Um, you know, we think about, you know, my generation thinks about the 0405 lockout. Uh, I know there's a generation before that, uh, that, that thinks about the, the, the one in the early nineties, but there was actually a player strike. And this is sort of, I, I don't even know if Alan, this is where you want to start or if it's pre the player strike, or if it's Alan Eagle, Eagleson's, uh, demise, if it all ties in together. But there is so much about this that has gone not unrecorded or unreported, but just underreported. And it's shaped so much of what the NHL is today. Uh, and it really is a, kind of, uh, it shines a light a little bit on what Gary Bettman's tenure started out as and what his goal and what his mandate from the owners, owners around the league was at the time. Um, so, I, I, you know, Alan, I don't know where you want to start here, but, you know, would you say it, does it start with Alan Eagleson? Does it start with what the NHLPA was before the 1990s? Where, where do you want to go here? Exactly. Well, well, Glenn came into the league in the, you know, 86, 87. Why don't you tell everybody what the NHL was like and what the NHLPA was like when you first came into the league? Well, I mean, you clearly had no player rights. I think arbitration rights didn't really exist in any way. Free agency, you became a free agent at 85. There was really nothing to prevent uh, us having any level of fairness. Eagleson was the, the leader of that for many years, was clearly working both sides of the fence, ownership side and player side, and uh, did us really no favors. And so when uh, the investigation into his dealings came about, and he had numerous uh, counts of fraud against him and uh, clearly not what you would want as a leader of your association. 
And when we did question it, it was a really divided group. I mean, I brought it up in a meeting in L.A. It said, basically, look, he's got 42 counts against him. Alan's a prosecutor. He knows what that means. That means you're in trouble. And uh, <laughs> one of the other players punched me in the side of the head, told me, don't ever fucking say anything about Eagleson again. I'm like, how are we keeping this guy around? Anyways, at the end of the day, the right thing was done. And we had a rebirth with a leader in Bob Goodnow, who we respected and uh, who was going to fight for a better tomorrow than today for players. And he did exactly that. And so the 80s and the 70s and the 60s, where baseball had a Marvin Miller who was running their association and Marvin was advocating for better pensions and licensing dollars. And you don't find too many baseball players not happy with what Marvin has done. Uh, he paved the road for all of those baseball players. We had 25 years of Allen and not Alan Walsh, Alan Eagleson. And so we were set back. So when I look at my job now, I know what the pensions are of the guys in the 60s and 70s that paved the roads for me to drive on them. And I hopefully paved them for Austin Matthews and his group to drive on them now. But uh, when I look at some of the rights and the pensions, it, it had to change, had to change in a level of fairness. And I guess the first time we put our shovel in the ground to make a difference would have been that strike in 92. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the major issues around the 92 strike? Uh, the NHLPA went into the season without a CBA and there was a uh, agreement to abide by the terms of the expired CBA, but the players could strike at any time. Mm -hmm. And, and to tell everyone what the major issues were and how that strike was such a seminal moment for the players going forward. Well, I think the, the biggest issue with regards to the players and our strike uh, was player likeness. So in other words, your IP, you own what you look like, name and number. And back before 1992 in that strike, the league owned it. And so there were two players in particular, Mario Lemieux and Wayne Gretzky, who basically said, we own our likeness and we would like to create a group licensing plan where the NHLPA can use that likeness to put players into hockey card sets and EA sports games and to have that ability to, again, as a, an association, monetize over the likeness of players. Yes, we don't own the crust on the front. The league owns that. But the name on the back is owned by the player. And so that was the strike of 92. And I, I remember, you know, my dad, who was a Scottish guy who fought in World War II. And I came home that day and I said, Dad, I, I think we're going to have a strike. And he said, what would it be about? I said, player likeness, dad. And he looked at me square in the eyes with a Scottish brogue and said, who the fuck would want to look like you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that uh, strike happened. There was three games left in the season and we were playing. I was with the New York Islanders, uh, one, their player rep, and uh, we were playing at Maple Leaf Gardens, a Saturday night hockey night in Canada. And we had a meeting in Bob's office uh, in, in Toronto and we, kind of talked about the issues, talked about whether there was going to be a strike or not a strike. And so in fairness for players, the biggest issue on that particular night was not strike or not strike, but how green is the light? Is it flashing green, full green, or are we playing tomorrow? Because Toronto's a fun city. And Bob brought me back into the PA office where he had a easel with a sheet of paper and he had written the number of what the strike vote had come in because we were the last team basically to vote. And that easel and that piece of paper had, and I'm, I'm going to come up with a number, but I know it's not accurate, but it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 358 players to strike to six players, not to strike. And mm -hmm. Bob was convinced the not strike guys just didn't understand English. They're from other countries. And so off we went and, uh, that was uh, basically turn of the worm, 10 day strike. Uh, we retained our likeness. And if you look at that piece of paper today, and if you're ever to wonder why Gary Bettman was hired, he should probably get a picture beside that piece of paper because that's where they made their change in leadership uh, at the NHL level and went with an, a new uh, unproven, but a guy who had some vision when it came to growing the business. And uh, that strike was the change for us that put us on the map, 
that gave us the dollars to be able to go hire lawyers, to have better arbitration rights, to have better pensions, to have all the benefits to make tomorrow better than today for a bunch of players. So what turned out to be who wants to look like me? Well, it was uh, Gretz and Mario, and they were the ones that adamantly said, we will not give up our rights. And so the league uh, changed their position on it. And uh, we ended up then playing three games in three days to finish off the season. And uh, I can tell you, I played all three. I have never been more tired in my life after the third game because if you <laughs> thought I was working out for those 10 days, eh, <laughs> I was. <laughs> I, I got to ask a couple questions, Glenn, because just for context, as a fan looking in on this, um, number one, I think the first thing that comes to mind is you, you, you wonder, okay, what does the name and likeness mean in the everyday life of a player? Why does that matter? What changed about that? Is it a pocketbook thing? Is like, is it a, what is that? And what, how does that change your dynamic and your relationship with the team and with the NHL and obviously the fans that are, are buying these licensed products? And then number two, when, when, when she adds that, I do want to talk about Bob Good now because he's a bit of an enigmatic character in that the guy doesn't do interviews anymore. And um, he's been mentioned in books. He's been mentioned in things, but he was an enormous force in the NHL for a very long time. So I, I just want to start, I guess we'll start first with where do, what did this mean for you, Glenn Healy, when this happened, uh, obviously the, it prompted cha change at the top of the NHL, but what does this mean for Glenn Healy, the New York Islander? Well, there are two kinds of rights for players. There are passive rights and there are active rights. And so active rights would be things like you want Daryl Sittler to show up at your birthday party or bar mitzvah. And we're going to pay him X thousands of dollars and he'll shake hands, kiss babies, sign autographs. That's an active right. He's actually doing something. Passive rights would be where players got together as a team, one team, and said, we will give up our passive rights. We don't have to do anything. And mm -hmm. you can take those rights and use them and put me into a hockey card set. And the NHLPA will get paid for it. Or you'll put me in a video game, EA Sports. No one has played more video games in this, this uh, pandemic than the world. So the <laughs> video game world is incredible. And so those passive rights, the ability for players to say, I want to be part of this. And, and it, it is all done in one fell swoop of a pen. So you get the rights of 700 players all at once. If EA Sports or Upper Deck was to go out and try to get these passive rights of each individual player, They'd be out of money after they got to Guy Lafleur. Done. So now they could do it at that time with one labor lawyer, one licensing lawyer, one business lawyer, one accountant, and a Bob Good now. So in some ways, very ingenious. And it led to more money into the coffers for players to get better rights, better benefits, better pensions, better working conditions. And if you look at what the alumni model is when I took over, well, didn't I just go back to the page that we wrote in 92 and do the same thing. I did the exact same thing with the exact same guys, only it was 25 years later. So where Wayne and Mario helped me as a player get the money that I made, a guy from Pickering, Ontario, which for anyone that doesn't know, Pickering's famous for eight nuclear reactors. So, <laughs> okay, that's the red too. Uh, But for a guy like me to be able to, to make the dollars that I made, uh, it again went back to those guys sacrificing what they had to sacrifice to make it better for me. And they did it again 25 years later to help a whole bunch of players. Now, alumni, we're not doing labor lawyers and arbitration and CBA issues, but we're hiring social workers and mental wellness groups and to make sure that the players have an enjoyable journey in their last part of their lives. So that would be the Coles Notes version of what those likeness and rights really truly mean. And the PA has lived off of that for all of those years from that strike, which lasted 10 days, years and years later, it is their lifeblood and it is ours. Yeah. Now heels, you, 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 you touched upon that uh, back in 1991, going into 1992, after the transition to Bob, the PA had basically no money in the bank. And uh, very few employees. I mean, when Bob first came on board, I believe they were in the back closet of Eagleson's law office on Maitland Street. Uh, and after the 10-day strike, 
I think one of the most important things was the players were perceived to have won. They got what they needed and what they wanted. And that gave the players and Bob a certain self-confidence leading into the next round of collective bargaining, which culminated in September 1994 and a lockout. Now, in the interim, as you said, John Ziegler out. The league and the owners were not happy with uh, the owner's perceived capitulation. And in comes Gary Bettman from the NBA. He was vice president of the NBA and marketed himself as the NBA godfather of the salary cap. And he comes into the NHL with one mantra, the first commissioner, we are going to bring a salary cap to the NHL in 1994. And even if it meant a lockout with the intent on crushing Bob, crushing the players and crushing the union, the NHL had never had a lockout before. So why don't you, based on that setting, tell us a little bit about leading up to 94 and 94 itself. Well, I think you're right. We were a unified group. We fought for something, stood for something, and it led to a win, and it led to galvanizing the group, but more importantly, uh, taking the revenues that the NHLPA had and timesing it by six or seven. And so that then gives you the ability to not only feel good about what you've accomplished, recognize it, you can see it, it's tangible. And then understanding that going into 1994, uh, okay, we had the strike in 92. Uh, the owners are, are smart, rich people, and they don't forget. And so we kind of knew something was coming. You know, you're going to get kids on Halloween, so you better get some candy. So we were ready for what was about to happen. The, the thing with the, the lockout in 94 This is all before the times of a Zoom call. Like no one ever said, you're on mute. Nobody. We didn't have mute. Uh, We would gather around as a team, around a phone, put it on speaker and learn what would be the business side of sport. Pre-92, we didn't understand the business of hockey. And when you looked at the business of hockey, when Gary took over, revenues across the league for sweaters, tickets, beer, hot dogs, memorabilia, like whatever it may be, was about $417 million. That's it. So this wasn't a big sport in a lot of ways. And uh, Bob was smart in the sense that he knew what Gary's constitution was. He knew that Gary only needed seven teams to say, let's go play. And he knew that if we pushed to the limit, what would be our limit, that more than likely there would be seven big teams like Toronto, like the Rangers. Uh, We can easily go through the list that would say, let's play hockey, drop the puck. We're not going to win this end zone item just yet. Uh, They were going to get it at some point, but in that particular lockout, they weren't getting it. We were too galvanized and the constitution that the league had didn't allow for there to be a lot of, a lot of wiggle room for a new commissioner. Hmm. So we get to January of 95 and uh, and Gary Bettman threatens to cancel the season within 48 hours if there's no deal. Do you remember what happened at that point and what your feelings were personally and your conversations with the players at that time? Well, we uh, and again, I was a player rep at that time and uh, we had had many meetings in Toronto and had flown back and met with the group in New York. And if you remember, I mean, we're the Rangers. We just won the Stanley Cup. And we're, we're like, you talked about Springsteen. We're like the Bruce Springsteen of hockey. We are, you're dancing around town with Mike Richter and Mark Messier and Brian Leach and, and Glenn Healy. Well, not so <laughs> I'm not a recordian guy of Springsteen. Uh, but, you know, we were well aware of the issues, knew what they were. And it came down in my mind to uh, who was going to blink first. So was it Gary that was going to say, all right, we've got to push this end zone item to another day to fight another day? Or is today the day that we we die on the hill fighting? 
And we firmly believe that we were in the right and that it wasn't the right time for there to be a cap. And so he blinked first and immediately after blinking and we had a season, the constitution changed. It then became, you need seven teams to say, we no play. And that's a different argument, right? When you've got seven teams that can easily, we can come up with the names of those, just watch a game tonight, see who's not sitting in the seats. And because we are a revenue-based league based on bums in the seats. And, uh, and the ownership group changed in, in 1994. You know, gone were some of the owners that were 100 heirs and even millionaires couldn't fit into the group. It was billionaires. So the clubs meant less to some of these owners. Uh, but it was a fight that I, I think we felt we were in the right. And uh, we did lose a bit of momentum that year. I mean, if you remember the Sports Illustrated article yeah. where we were the guys on the cover of the article, like we were surpassing basketball. We were surpassing, you know, the big sports. We were it. And a lot of that had to do with the Rangers winning a cup. So uh, that one hard fought. Uh, and again, this is all before social media, Zoom, Internet. And so, you know, maybe having... A, not having all the knowledge, but being galvanized and saying, don't ever push us around. Uh, we were a very unified group. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, one of the, one of the main characters in this and, and then what happened 10 years later was Bob Goodnow. And, you know, I read and, and uh, I'm not sure if you guys have read Brian Burke's book. I know that they were friends and that they are no longer, but Brian was one of the guys that recommended him to be, uh, according to Brian, anyway, in this book, uh, to be the guy that um, uh, would take over the NHLPA. Uh, Bob was, from from what I understand, and again, you know, I, having never dealt with him, it's 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 hard to know what Bob was. I think a lot of people in my generation, when you know we were kids when this happened, um, would benefit from knowing what effect Bob had on the PA after 1992. Cause you know, you talk about the fact that the, the, the 10 day strike leads to the NHLPA being funded properly. So you get, you're, you're finally able to do the things that you need to be able to do to kind of push this forward. Then we get to the lockout. And I, I wanted to know, firstly, what Bob Goodnow's personality brought to the NHLPA, Glenn and Alan, I'm asking you both. And then secondly, what his big wins in that particular lockout were, because obviously one of them is, the NHL owners did not get the salary cap they wanted. Yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, if, if you, again, history's our teacher. So if I go back to a meeting we had with Alan Eagleson in the 80s and uh, recall sitting in Detroit and, you know, at the time I was a young player and uh, my roommate had been traded. So any player that they called up from the minors, they would just put in my house. And so <laughs> if you can think about it, you're saving wow. money for the hotel. And okay, I'm living with a guy who's coming up for like three days and he's got daddy's credit card and it's March break. And I'm trying to stay in the league. This guy's going to be up for a party and leave. So the question was pretty simple. Like, is it legal for them? Every time they call a player up, he becomes my bunkie. <laughs> Eagleson at the time told me to shut up and I was lucky I was in the league. Okay, that's not exactly uh me employing you is what you should say to someone who pays your salary. Just saying, I don't know. And where Bob it was a different approach. He, he educated the players. He educated the players about the business of hockey. He galvanized the group. He was a magnanimous kind of speaker. He would get up in front of a room and he could control and, and command a room. Uh, but I think the biggest thing that he did was he, he brought the stars into the group so that they believed that they were the ones that were the biggest part of our team, so to speak. And they were. There are not many people buying Glenn Healy T-shirts, just saying even now. But I tell you what, a Mark Messier, a Mario Lemieux, a Matt Sundin, uh, these are names that resonate with the fan group. And so, Bob, he grabbed the big guys. He was magnanimous. He taught us about the business of hockey. Uh, and, you know, early on, he was all about, look, this is what's fair for NHL players. And he built a, a real strong uh, business platform that uh, for to this day is is vibrant. And a lot of that has to do with the way he looked at things in his world and the hard work that he put into what was an organization, as Alan knows early on, was a joke, a complete joke in every way, from pensions to any rights that any player had. That changed with Bob. Yeah, and what Bob said when he started going around and meeting players after ascending to the executive director role was 
I have a dream. It was Bob's I have a dream speech that every player who plays in the NHL when they're done does not have to get a job and go to work if they don't want to. You have the freedom to take a couple of years and raise your family. You have the freedom to finally, you've been playing hockey every single year since you're five years old to take a break and you don't have to worry about paying the bills the day you step away from the game. And, and, and that was empowering to, uh, to a group of players who really, just like you said, were constantly being bullied and humiliated and screamed at by the guy who was supposed to be leading them in Eagles. Yeah. And I, I guess the, I have a dream speech. I guess I never got that memo because I've worked every day since I left the game. <laughs> you know, I've done something wrong, but uh, it's, you're, it's you're, a dream still. It's a dream. It's a, dream. a good one. You're, you are bang on. And uh, you know, uh, Bob had that vision. He had that leadership and he hired really good people to work for the players and I think that was his big, but there were so many changes that he, he made, you know, our pensions became realistic. You, you, you actually could have a pension. You would have something when you retired and you turned 65, you would have a nest egg that you could draw on because the guys that played in the sixties, uh, I know what their pensions are. Some of them that had played nearly 20 years, you get $7,000 Canadian a year. You can't even go to Disneyland with that money. There you go. Now your pension's done. You know, so there was a whole host of things that changed. Average salary clearly went up in a huge weight. Salary disclosure was a big thing for players. You know, we went through that time where I'll be honest, anyone asked me what I made, I just lied because I was embarrassed to say what I made. <laughs> you know, uh, so are you making 150? I oh, know 180, 180. I was only making 62, but it didn't matter. I was a, you know, salary disclosure. Now you can compare an apple to an apple. Now I can look at another goalie and say, save percentage, same as mine, goals against, same as mine, and, you know, win percentage. And he's played seven years. So have I. So I should be getting the same amount of money, knowing full well that I would win in arbitration rights that we had negotiated as well with a level of strength. So it was more than likely that the club would just agree to terms based on comparing that. So again, a small thing, but, you know, without Bob coming in there and doing so, and Hey, it was fought back hard. There were a lot of players didn't want anybody knowing what they made. And this goes back to the Gordy Howe days where Bobby Bond went up to Gordy and said, you know, I make more than you, don't you? And there was a, an aghast on Gordy's face. Like there's no way I do. And so you know, back to the, the Bobby Bonds that were starting to make changes and the Ted Lindsay's who sacrificed his entire career for us. Uh, but all of that generation helped us to make the right decisions we had to make when the time was right. And Gordy was promised by uh, the Red Wings ownership and GM that he would always be the highest paid player on the team and always believed that and was shocked one day to realize there were six or seven guys making more money than him. Yeah, and uh, that would be a shock for Mr. Hockey and a guy who played in, in five different decades and is revered. I, I mean, if anybody can tell me who the best player in the game is, I'm going to ask Wayne, and he says it's Gordy. Uh, most of us would say Wayne. Wayne's just being, I, I guess, humble in a sense. But, you know, there's a guy who clearly should have been the highest paid player for sure in the game of hockey and wasn't. So salary disclosure, you know, a great benefit to uh, – to, to Bob to come up with that idea. Uh, he came up with uh, agent disclosure. We knew what agents were charging us. So yep. we knew if Alan Walsh was taking advantage of players. Most of things that changed, but, uh, but clearly it was just about, again, making a better tomorrow than today for players and their families. And, um, you know, do some guys have to work when the game ends? I think we all need a little purpose in our life and it would be sure. right. Uh, and I think a lot of guys golf for the first two years and then go, I'm sick of golf. I need to do something. And, you know, we all want to get back in the game. That's what we know best. Uh, there's only 32 GM jobs. So it gets a little dicey when you want to get back in. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the changes that were made during 
you know, my tenure as a player, I'm pretty proud of to say that uh, we fought for what was right. And, you know, I look at my family dynamic and, you know, my dad fighting World War II. That's what he would have wanted for me. And so I just following in what was right. I'm not always going to be right, but I'm going to fight for what's right. That's what we did. Hmm. And I mean, uh, w- one of the things that uh, I know that years ago, the CBC did a, um, uh, a, a drama on the Ted Lindsay story. And for anybody that doesn't know, Ted Lindsay, Detroit Red Wings legend, played with uh, Gordie Howe um, and quite literally sacrificed his career because Jack Adams and the ownership group in Detroit basically wanted to keep every player under as underpaid as possible. The players had no rights. So the formation of the of the NHLPA started with with Ted Lindsay. But the reaction to Ted Lindsay creating this from owners at the time was vicious. And I mean, I think the Detroit Red Wings ended up shipping him out of town to Chicago and the Chicago owner, I think there's a scene where he dumps popcorn on his head and there's a, you know, that might be a dramatization, but it's representative of the fact that these guys really had to fight. And I'm curious, Glenn, you know, when you guys, when Alan Eagleson was out, and again, I meant to ask you at the beginning of the episode, if you've never heard the name Alan Eagleson before, what was, what was the fraud he was up for guys? What, what exactly was he fraudulent about? Where do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> so I just, because I want to put that into context because it seems it's shocking that a professional league had a, uh, had a representative like that with 42 counts of fraud. How does that happen? Keep in mind that not only was he the executive director of the NHLPA, but he was also running a player agency and representing players, which is like an incredible conflict of interest. And uh, if, if a player suffered, for example, a career ending injury and had uh, disability insurance, if you had Eagleson as your agent, he would help you negotiate with the insurance company to get your payout, even though he would take an a, a unlawful percentage off the top to do that. But if you didn't have Eagleson as your agent, and you went to him as the head of the NHLPA and asked for his help. It's very well documented. He told you to take a hike. So uh, you, and you could sell ahead. you could sell the ads behind the net, but we can't sell them, right? The owners have those. Oh, okay. Then you could sell the ads on the boards, but we can't sell those because the players have them. And then you come to find out that both sides neither have them. No one has them except one guy. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so uh, Paul Kelly would be a great guy to have on. It was a federal prosecutor out of Boston who, uh, who ended up uh, being the guy spearheading, uh, taking him down with his criminal charges. But, you know, you mentioned Ted Lindsay and Ted was a real, he was a real feisty kind of guy. And, and um, it, it, it's, it's too bad. He's not around to tell some of the stories, but I recall uh, one time with Ted, he pulled me aside and he said, you know, Glenn, I like going in the corners. And I'm like, Ted, I'm a goalie. Like I haven't gone in a corner in my life. Why do you like going in the corners? And he said, well, when I go on the, and I told this story at his funeral. I, uh, when I go in the corners, I know right away whether I'm going in with a man or a chicken shit. <laughs> so in your life, Glenn, do not be afraid to go in the corners. And I think that message was was loud and clear when he he created what he created. And, you know, Ted did many things even after his career was over. You know, we're about to uh, cut a bunch of checks to about six hundred and five players. It's called supplemental gifting. It was uh, at the time, one hundred and forty two players who had zero pension, basically. And the NHL and the NHLPA have have bumped up some of the money as a gift to make do for what was 25 years of, of Allen. And so Ted took part in those meetings with myself and Pat Flatley. And the three of us desperately tried to spearhead this. Uh, we had Bobby Orr and John Beliveau on the letterhead because I didn't want to go into the meetings have people going, who's Glenn Healy again? Did he play? <laughs> so Western Michigan where? So <laughs> one of the first little blushes at this, and it didn't go very well. And Ted and I were walking down the street in Toronto and he had on a suit that didn't match his shirt, that didn't match his tie, didn't match his shoes. And he just kind of looked at me and went, well, that didn't go very well, did it? (laughs) No, no, Ted. Uh, But we'll get the next win. And uh, so he spearheaded that. And so 605 players will will get the advantage of Ted fighting long after his career for what he believed was right 
to to take what was a, a, a poor pension plan and try to make it so that players could afford medication, could afford health care. It makes a huge difference for so many players who, who didn't have the financial gains that, you know, the players today have where the salaries are, are at a level that weren't when I started and clearly weren't when Ted played. And Glenn, what you did when you were at the NHLPA, and I vividly recall this, was bring Ted Lindsay back into the fold, bring him in to talk to players and talk to players about what he went through in the 50s, the reasons why he tried to form a players association and the kind of retaliation that was directed at him uh, by the owners. You brought him to agent meetings and uh, had him speak to agents who many didn't know the history uh, of, of what he had done off the ice and the contributions and sacrifices he personally made to his own career for the betterment of all the players. Yeah, you know, our mission statement with the NHL alumni is honor the past. And so clearly, um, I probably learned that lesson back when I was at the NHLPA uh, working with the player affairs group. If, if we don't know where we've been, I don't know how we're, we know where we're going to get to. And so that was my way of honoring the past and understanding what sacrifices he had made, how hard it was to do what he had to do. I mean, you're asking someone to give up something that they have dreamed and, and you'll never, you will never get a better job than playing in the NHL. Maybe an agent, you know, maybe it's a little better. I don't know, but I'd say not, uh, Playing in the NHL, it's the best job you'll ever have. And he gave it up for a whole bunch of players. And so honor the past would be our mission at the alumni statement. And it, it should be the one for the NHL PA too, because uh, there's a whole lot of history there that has have paved the way uh, for the rights that the players currently have today. And, uh, and so I, I'll always remember it and I'll always honor the past. That's one thing you're always going to get from me. And I want to add something there because you literally put your money where your mouth is. Uh, in, in 1994, the issue, uh, the main issue uh, between the NHL and the NHLPA was the salary cap. And you missed out on half a season's worth of pay. And uh, you were fortunate to play 16 years where the average career is four, four plus, uh, four and a half years. And, and you gave up a half a year of, of your salary to fight against a salary cap. And from 1995 to 2004, the average salary and the median salary of NHL players exploded. And that was directly caused by the sacrifice you and fellow NHL PA members made back in 1994, 95. So all those players owe you guys a debt of gratitude because you sacrificed so that those guys could have uh, more money, more rights, better pensions and, and more meaningful careers. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, and there was carnage too, with regards to players in the sense that, you know, when you go a half a season without playing, well, the general manager of the team is going to go watch the minor league team play. And while he's watching that minor league team play, he's going to think, you know what? That defenseman there, he might be a replacement for my defenseman that's played 10 years. Because the 10-year guy's making a lot of money. So why don't I just throw this guy in the lineup? So in any year that there is a work stoppage, you have an enormous amount of players that never lace up skates again. And hey, if you're a lawyer, you go work in another law firm right? Sell cars, lots of car dealerships, go work somewhere else. At the NHL level, there's nowhere else to go. There's one league. Unless you want to go to Russia, and of which case you've got 20 minutes of sunlight every day, and probably that will lead to a a terrible experience and a divorce, which is going to cost you a lot more money than you made when you went over there. So forget that for an option. Uh, But, you know, Bob would always, uh, when we had those meetings, he would always have a bunch of coins in his pocket. He would shake the coins around and he would throw them on the table. And he'd go, there you go, boys. You take a cap, fight over the money because you're fighting over the money internally. And when all that money's off the table, there's no more money. Okay. Hmm. That's 95. Was he right? Oh yeah. 
hell yeah, he was right. So, so yeah, what the one thing we didn't want was to internally have to fight where if I take a little more, that means that this player, and again, you could call it a cap casualty if you want. Uh, it is a family that loses out on a year's salary. It's a kid that maybe doesn't get to go to a school that they want. It's an, another year of your pension. Like, there's a whole host of things. It's not a cap casualty. It's an actual family that's being affected by a system that we didn't want to be part of. And, and to that point, Glenn, and I know, I mean, listen, we, we could do multiple episodes and I, I think we're going to have to, we probably talk about 0405 at a different time, because I think certainly we need to discuss that because that's when the cap was instituted. But, you know, for right now uh, in that particular, that particular context, what was, one of the things, if you work in a small business or you work in a business at all, you're always, you, you never want to make your boss mad and you definitely want, never want to make the owner mad. And if you guys, you know, you guys strike before, you know, strike in the last 10 days of the 92 season and the owners lock you out in 94, 95 over this cap for four, four months, I believe it was, or you got back in February. What was it like going face to face with owners before, during and after? Obviously, we knew something was brewing. And then there's this, there's the lockout itself. And then there's when, you know, when everybody, you know, everybody goes, okay, here's the new collective bargaining agreement for the next decade. Let's all get back to work. I'm sure there was hurt feelings on both sides. Was there any sort of awkwardness throughout this process? Were there any sort of conversations that you go, wow, I can't even believe that happened? Well, I can tell you that when we had the 10 day strike and we were in Toronto to play on a hockey night in Canada and we're at Maple Leaf Gardens. And so the word comes out that this is going to go down. And we had our press conference at the Sky Dome that afternoon to announce wow. that we were done. And, uh, and at the time, the payroll of the New York Islanders. So this was a team that just came off a dynasty. We were around four million dollars. The whole team. Everybody. Wow. You know, and, and, and Gretzky made eight that year, by the way, in LA. And just my salary was included in that as well. So it might have been 4.1, but it wasn't much. <laughs> and uh, and that, day, that day at the gardens, uh, when we went to practice, uh, we were told we didn't deserve to wear sweaters. You can't have that sweater on. You don't deserve it. You're going to bankrupt this league. And so sure enough, we went out at Maple Leaf Gardens, places full with, as it normally is on a Saturday with all the media, and here are the guys, no shirts, practicing, knowing that in the afternoon, an announcement was coming. And we had to, we were told specifically, good luck finding your own way home. I don't know. Isn't there an airport around here or something? Like, could we maybe, we could probably find a flight. I don't think I have to take a Greyhound. Uh, but it, I think it depended from an ownership standpoint on what team you played for. So the New York Islanders at the time uh, was owned by a guy that I never met once. Actually, I got Christmas cards from him and, and I took me like to, and this is how smart I am. The third year before I realized he wasn't even in the cards. It was just his kids. I oh. thought oh, this is the kind of good looking dark haired one in the background. It was his kid. So, but now if you played for Chicago and you had uh, Bill Wirtz and, you know, Bill pulled up in his limo, um, which he drove, by the way, he never got a driver. He just drove his own limo in the front seat. Uh, that would have been more of a, a tragic uh, kind of interchange. Uh, certainly a Boston would have been different too, uh, but it, I think it just depended on the team. I remember uh, when the LA Kings won the Stanley cup and I was there at ice level between the benches and uh, this older guy came on the ice and, and the whole talk with hockey night in Canada is that, is that Anschutz? Is that the owner? Cause no one had ever seen him. So <laughs> I think it just depends on who the owner was uh, and what kind of grief you got. But, you know, again, it goes back to we weren't going to be right all the time, but we were we were doing what we believed was right. And we were true to it because it was right. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Is there a picture of you guys practicing without your jerseys on? Because that's that's hockey history right there. That should be in the Hall of Fame. Got to be somewhere, um, <laughs> somewhere in the archives. Someone from the Toronto Star has to have <laughs> have to have that picture. And and Pat Flatley was the captain, and he he was like, "Well, boys, we're going out to practice, and there's, no, there's shirts and skins. Here we go." Oh. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Amazing. But it was uh, it was a, a de definitely a, a weird time in the sense that uh, you know 
uh, we didn't know what was on the horizon and uh, really had didn't have the financial wherewithal at the PA level to fight anything of any significance. But uh, changes were coming at the NHL level and, and Gary took over from that that point on. I have a picture of uh, us with the Stanley Cup at the White House with Bill Clinton, and it's a great shot. And if you look off to the far left, you see this guy with dark hair and you look at it close and it, it's Gary. And I'm thinking to myself now, all these years later, there is no chance if we're at the White House. He's not either sitting in the cup or he's right beside the cup, but he's right there. But not <laughs> on the, side. So, at the end of the day, um, you know, what, what we all want to do is, Hey, yes, it's, it's a great way to make a living, but it's that uh, ability to compete for the greatest trophy. And uh, those are be some of my great memories. Um, yeah, it's nice to make some money and put in your genes along the way and take care of your family. But it was a, achieving a dream for me and getting my name on it. It's my family name, my last name. So all the sacrifices my family made is so I could get to that moment. And that, that was a big moment for me. Wow. Well, I mean, uh, Alan, if, do you have any on this particular subject? Because Glenn, we could probably keep here for four hours. Um, Alan, is there any questions left that you think, or any places you want to take this that you think the audience needs to know about this on this episode? Because I think, at least to my mind, we're, we're going to have to have Glenn back at some point here, but you, you tell me what, where, are we missing anything here? What I'd really like to do is have Glenn back at some point in time, sooner than later and talk about Glenn's mission at the alumni association and talk about um, the resources available to retired players uh, and, and the role that, that Glenn has, has taken upon himself uh, doing some incredible, incredible work that wasn't being done before. There was a huge void out there. And, and, and Glenn, you stepped into that void and uh, uh, you've made a huge difference in, in many former players' lives. And uh, you know some stories. I know some stories. I'd like to tell those stories uh, one day when you've been very generous with your time. I would love for you to come back at some point in time and tell those stories. You know, I, I'd love to, because if you think about it, uh, the mission for me is how do I make tomorrow better than today for a bunch of players and their families? Uh, you know, when you don't have money, that's all you think about. When you don't have your health, that's all you think about. And you feel hopeless and helpless. And that's where the alumni comes in to, to make a real difference uh, because we're all on one team. And what makes us successful and what made us successful in 92 and in 94 it's the players. The players have all stuck together. And I have not had a single player that has played a game in the NHL say to me uh, that they don't want to help. It's the opposite. Every player has said, what can I do to help? I haven't done enough. And I recall Ted Lindsay telling me exactly that in Vegas, saying, what can I do to help? And I looked at him and I said, Ted, I think you've done enough. I think you've done enough. So but that's the way players are. They just want to make sure that, hey, anyone that falls through the cracks, we got them. And we do. We have an army to launch to make sure we can make a difference for players. So I'd love to come back on and, and talk about it. It would be it would be an honor and a, and a privilege to get together with you two good looking gentlemen. <laughs> one anyways. <laughs> oh, come on. Don't compliment Alan like that with me here. Come on. Um, you know, Glenn, from a from a, a guy for a from a hard bitten Scottish family, you sure have a lot of heart. And uh, that last sentiment there was quite touching. And uh, I can't wait to find out more about it and have you back. And um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, and I know that there's going to be a lot of people who walk away from this episode going, I didn't know any of that. It's unbelievable. And uh, so thank you for, for the insights and, and thank you for the time. Yeah, thanks. thank you so much, Heels. Thanks for your time and thanks for the great stories and educating everybody on, on a little bit of uh, NHL and NHLPA history. Great. Thanks, Alan. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's an honor.